Welcome back to part two, where I'll talk more about diagnosis and treatment. The first steps in diagnosis are always an appropriate clinical history and examination. For the congenital version, clinical pointers include severe weakness and loss of muscle tone and respiratory muscle involvement. Severe facial weakness often leads to a characteristic inverted V-shaping of the lips and impaired ability to feed. Curiously, the clinical and EMG myotonia only commence later on at around the age of five. In childhood onset DM1, the diagnosis is often harder to make, though facial weakness and myotonia are often present, as are cardiac conduction abnormalities. Both congenital and childhood forms affect the brain and lower intelligence. Adult onset DM1 often has facial muscle weakness leading to wasting of the temporalis muscles together with droopy eyelids and weakness in the muscles of the hands and feet. Clinical myotonia is often problematic in the hand with impaired ability to relax grasp and can also cause problems when chewing or talking. Frontal balding is also a well recognized feature. Early onset cataracts are a characteristic feature and occur in the posterior capsule and are very colourful and often proceed many years before muscle symptoms begin. Cardiac conduction abnormalities are common as well as excessive sleepiness, apneas and reduced drive to the respiratory muscles. Patients may also have a variety of gastrointestinal symptoms and there may be cognitive and behavioural issues as well. Of course, Endocrine problems are common systemic features and include type 2 diabetes, thyroid dysfunction and testicular atrophy and hypotestosteronism leading to gynecomastia in males. Late onset DM can be very subtle and may only show features of myotonia and the cataracts. In DM2 there is a slowly progressive muscle weakness over the age of 50 with associated pain, stiffness and variable myotonia. The cataracts are only present in a minority and so it's easy to misdiagnose as fibromyalgia. Cardiac conduction issues are less frequent and central nervous system impairment is in fact very rare. The most important diagnostic tests are genetic studies looking for the CTG or the CCTG repeats with PCR and southern blotting analysis depending on the anticipated repeat length. EMG and muscle biopsy can also be helpful, but given the advent of genetics-based diagnosis, these now tend to be used for screening purposes or for when other conditions have also been a consideration. Treatment is multidisciplinary and should be led by a neuromuscular specialist. If the myotonia is very debilitating, there are certain medications that can be helpful, such as mexelatine, but these do have potential side effects, such as exacerbating the muscle weakness and cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac teams may be necessary to monitor and treat any rhythm disturbances or cardiomyopathy. Respiratory teams may be required to assist with impaired ventilation, particularly at night, especially if non-invasive ventilation is required. Patients may also need cough assist devices to prevent chest infections and flu and pneumonia vaccinations to reduce respiratory infections, which are a significant cause of mortality. Ophthalmic specialists will often be needed to remove the cataracts and endocrinologists to manage the diabetes, thyroid dysfunction and hypogonadism. It's very important that myotonia patients inform surgeons and anaesthetists of their condition whenever surgery is being planned to avoid potential and serious complications. Complications are not proportional to the severity of the disease and British patients can in fact obtain a free alert card from the myotonic dystrophy support group, see the link below. American and indeed all patients can obtain and even hand their medical teams an instruction leaflet regarding anesthesia from the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, again you can see the link below. Both of these websites provide very valuable sources of information and links to the relevant support groups. Associated healthcare professionals are also very important with geneticists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, counselling and orthotics providing holistic and coordinated care. Future treatment will hopefully target the cause which is the aberrant RNA and spinosopathy. If you haven't already done so, please see the first video which explains the pathophysiology by clicking on the i-card above. 
current work is now focusing on how to minimize the amount and impact of this abnormal RNA using special small molecules which can gain access to the aberrant RNA clusters and hairpins and are potentially exciting developments being developed for the near future. I hope you've benefited from this video and please don't forget to support this channel by liking, subscribing and sharing. Many thanks for your support.